Why, if you wanted to get married so badly, did you not travel to another state where it's legal for same-sex couples to get married? We, 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 we did think about it, um, especially when New Mexico opened up, because that's not quite as financially, that's a little easier to get to than some other places. Um, but, you know, we're both Texans, and we came back, uh, I, w I was raised in Austin, I went to Austin schools, graduated from UT. We came back um, to take care of my parents who were ailing and uh, so we've been back in Austin since 1992 and we just felt like, you know, um, we really want to get married in Texas and uh, with my cancer diagnosis things got um, more urgent for us. There is a couple I know, man and woman, um, who'd been together for decades and she was diagnosed with breast cancer and at that point they decided that they really needed the protections of legal marriage. Um, Suzanne, do you have mm -hmm. some? Well, I, I think Sarah and I are Texans. We were both born here. Um, we met each other in North Carolina and lived on the East Coast for a few years, but we came home holidays to see her parents in Austin and my parents, my mother in Lubbock. And we've always been Texans and we moved back here. We've raised our children here, as Sarah has said before, we'll probably die here and we want to get married here. And we have a real history behind us of both of our families being here and settling here and making Texas home. And we're very proud to be Texans and have always said we'll get married in Texas. And we did, and I'm really glad we could. Uh, it's home. And I think it's important too, what we've learned um, since our wedding is how many, how very many, especially young people, um, really want to get married and you know not everybody can go off to some exotic place um, if they've got kids like we do it's like hey you know like what's kind of squeezing it in between all your other family obligations or just the financial cost of going somewhere else so um, I'm going to be happy when other folks like us can also get married in Texas and there's a lot of speculation what's coming up with the U.S. Supreme Court. They're going to hear arguments in April, rule by probably end of June, maybe early July. And the speculation is, among even members of the court, that same-sex marriage will soon be legal nationwide. Why not wait for that moment? Um, I, my diagnosis uh, of ovarian cancer was last May. I had emergency surgery. And um, we just realized, well, actually, especially with, with Stella Powell's situation, which I'm, I'm referring to the woman with um, colon cancer who died, um, we actually knew Stella personally. I didn't know her, about her health status, but I think that brought home to us the urgency of the need for Suzanne, for me, for Suzanne to be considered next of kin so that um, automatically uh, she would be given the right to make uh, health decisions, um, financial decisions, and that we would, in being treated like next of kin, there's all those uh, automatic kinds of, uh, kinds of decisions that she's going to be the person allowed to make those. And we have a question from a viewer here. When did you realize you were going to be a history-making couple, and are you comfortable with your wedding taking on this kind of significance and legal battle? Uh, last February, about a year ago, when there was the federal court case in San Antonio, we hoped that there would be a window of opportunity, as there had been in other states, where a marriage ban was found unconstitutional, and the decision wasn't immediately stayed. So a year ago, we had our clothes in the car and our rabbi at the ready in case we had that opportunity. So we, we have been wanting to get married 
before that even, eight years ago, we, we tried uh, to get a, a marriage license at the county clerk's office and were very graciously turned away because we were a same gender couple. Um, we have a sign in our house that says 22 years and two kids and that's how we know exactly it was eight years ago. Um, and so we tried again a year ago, didn't quite happen. And then our amazing legal team, uh, Chuck Herring leading that, said, we think based on Stella Powell and her widow's case, there is a window of opportunity. Are you ready? And so we literally grabbed our clothes and showed up at the clerk's office hoping this would happen, and it did. And we've been thrown into this opportunity, and we're going to do the best we can to put a face on our family. And, you know, we are surprised at the amount of coverage this has gotten. It, um, you know, I think maybe because it's Texas, and people, Texas has a mystique, people are interested, you know, it's a very uh, important, politically powerful, economically wealthy state, and I think also, you know, uh, traditionally very conservative state. Um, and so I think that may be part of what's driving this as well. In fact, that's how we met. It was a year ago I asked around because I knew when the Judge Garcia's decision came down, if it was the way it looked like it was going to go from arguments in his court that he was going to strike down the marriage ban. From what happened in other states, I knew there was going to be a rush to the altar. Mm -hmm. and I said, find me a couple that's ready to go, and I'd follow them. And uh, it didn't happen, but uh, that's how we got to, mm -hmm. got to know that's each exactly other. exactly right. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, what, I, this is blown up much more than we ever thought it would. We were just willing to get married. We wanted to get married so badly. That was a personal decision. We had no idea about the publicity. And we're going to step up to the plate. It's an opportunity. But it could be any, any one of thousands of families in Texas doing just what we're doing. I had to turn off my Twitter feed announcements because when I took a picture of you guys registering your wedding saying, here's the couple that just got married legally in Texas by a judge's order, it went wild. It was, yeah, I, I lost all my emails under that because I didn't know what was going on. We do have another one here from Jane Heyman. Jane, and if I said your name wrong, it's because it's very lightly shaded on here. So what are your thoughts on the argument advanced by the state of Texas that protection of responsible procreation is paramount and same-sex marriage is contrary to that policy? Hmm. Um, I think that a married couple, a heterosexual married couple loving each other and having children is a fabulous thing and I think it's wonderful. I think there are a lot of heterosexual married couples who either cannot have children or choose to not have children. I also think that there are a lot of same gender couples like us who want to have children and families are so different today. The idea of the mom and the dad and he works and she stays home is not the way families are anymore. There are single parents, there are grandparents raising children, there are gay men, lesbians, heterosexuals, and they're all families. And uh, one of the books we had for our kids when they were little was called All Kinds of Families. And I think the modern family really is not all about procreation with a mom and a dad. And, I, you know, that's, that's an argument before the court, and they're going to have to assess, um, you know, the validity of that claim and whatever standard they need to apply to that legally. Did you find it interesting that the argument changed when it went to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals? The state abandoned an argument that, was, that it advanced in the district court that same-sex marriage was bad for raising children. You have two children. Suzanne can really speak to that because I think that's a, early on there was a lot, I'm going to let you speak to it actually, really. Um, <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> but uh, there was a lot of um, sort of a claim that children raised in same gender households had, you know, that was kind of an inherent disadvantage for those children. And then there, I think there was a lot of social science research. I remember Suzanne was helping get the information out that if you actually looked at the studies, these are just well-adjusted kids. 
Well, so Sarah and I have been together for 30 years, and over those 30 years talked about having children and been very aware of the studies. And 30 years ago, there weren't very many studies. And now there are many, many, many credible stories. And they talk about things like it is good for children to have two parents. It is good for children to have two loving individuals who are responsible for them, but it doesn't really matter if it's a mom and a dad, or two moms, or two dads. What's important is that they have a loving family. And all things being equal, kids are just as well off, just as well adjusted, uh, do as well in school, are not teased by their peers because they have two moms or two dads. Or, or grandparents. It's just, it's just that connection between kids and parents. I heard something, I think it was probably, I don't know if it was NPR, but just about kids and are, is one kid feel favored? Well, it's not, um, if a household, the, the research showed that if, um, if one kid feels like the other child is favored, then that's kind of a, could be a problem. But then the research shows that if it's a really bonded family, a really tightly bonded family, then even when one of the children feels, you know, like, hey, they like my brother or sister better, even when they feel that, it doesn't have any effects. And, I, you know, one thing you can say for, um, you know, for our families is these are very much wanted children. We have a question from John Crane. Congratulations on being the first same-sex couple to marry in Texas. I can't think of a better couple to put a face on marriage equality in our state, which isn't really a question, it's an exclamation point. But have you been getting these kind of reactions? Wow. Um, I had to post on Facebook yesterday because I went down to the mail and we had an envelope, address envelope, and I opened it up. It had two rings on the front. It said, congratulations. And it was congratulations, said, about time, Rob, your mailman. Um, and I just thought that was so incredibly wonderful. So, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the just incredible, incredible support that we've received. The, the outpouring of love and support from relatives in England, friends we haven't seen since high school, has been amazing. And we haven't had a chance yet to get back to people and say, thank you for the card, thank you for the flowers, thank you for the well wishes. You know, people have said, where, do you, where are you registered? And we, we want things to go either to the care communities in Austin that has volunteers working with people with cancer or HIV AIDS who are alone, or the second organization would be Equality Texas Foundation. And we just need to get back to people and say, thank you for your well wishes, thank you for your gifts, and here's where we're registered. It's been overwhelmingly wonderful. Yeah, when, you're as, when you've been together as long as we have, it's not like getting stuff, it's like getting rid of stuff, so. <laughs> That's true. Has there been any reaction that stood out besides the mailman? <laughs> you know, actually there has been for me. Um, I don't read um, comments too much because people are like, oh, you don't really want to read the comments because sometimes with the internet being a faceless kind of thing, people are emboldened to say things that they wouldn't say to your face. If you could, they could see your face and you could see theirs. But I went, um, I looked at the Amarillo paper, um, which as, you know, it wasn't surprising to me that since the, the editorial staff there felt it was judicial activism, and you know, we're all kind of like, it's, it's judicial activism if you don't like it, if you do like it, then it's, you know, uh, it's protecting our Constitution. So I'll, I'll let the Amarillo paper have their opinion. But when I read down through the comments, it was just amazing to me um, how, you know, the comments were actually running very positive for us. And many people have told us about their, you know, fiscally conservative friends or Tea Party friends, you know, whose kind of first idea is personal freedom. Um, it's kind of a mind your own business and personal freedom. And that we're finding that people from no matter what their party affiliation, there are a lot of people who think the state of Texas has better stuff to deal with than, um, you know, trying to invalidate our, our marriage license. We have a question from Patsy. What will happen if your marriage is voided and as our Attorney General is seeking, do you have a plan? 
I guess we'll be right where we were less than a week ago, and we'll be like all the other couples in Texas waiting to see what the U.S. Supreme Court does. Except, um, not only did we have the license, and the plan is, you know, we have attorneys who are going to, the Supreme Court's ask us, or ask our attorneys to answer the Attorney General's, um, is it a writ of mandamus? It was. Okay. Um, and so they'll be providing legal arguments. Um, in our view, having that registered license, um, that cannot be taken away from us. But I think more importantly, um, we had a uh, religious ceremony in our faith tradition. And, uh, you know, having, in, in our case, our rabbi bless us and being recognized as married in the eyes of God uh, is something that, that um, can't wow, that that's support. The meaning of that, I and mean, I, I think I'm still trying to figure out personally the meaning of that. And um, that can't be taken away. And that was just amazing. And I will throw in that, that there are, there's been an amazing outpouring of support, not just from friends, not from strangers, but also from legal scholars and uh, professors and lawyers who have said, you've got a valid marriage license. It was issued by the state of Texas. It was valid when issued and it won't be taken away from us. So I think we'll keep the marriage license, but that's for the lawyers and, and the, the justice system to figure out. But as Sarah said, we are married in the eyes of God. And in all of this rush, when things were happening so quickly, when the rabbi did the ceremony, everything slowed down. And the, the real importance of this came to both of us. And it was very special and magic. And, and I think that part of the, not the civil service, but the religious service can never be taken away. And, and, I, and for our kids, I mean, our kids, our youngest daughter, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this, but she wants a service where our uh, dog is the ring bearer. She's kind of figuring it all out. And um, I, I think, you know, it won't make a day-to-day -day difference, but I think it's made a day-to-day -day difference in a psychological support for our children. Mm -hmm. hmm. Let's take you back to that day for folks who weren't there, mm -hmm. and many weren't. Uh, it was fast. It went very quickly. You were waiting fast. in the uh, district clerk's office for word on whether or not your lawyers were going to be successful. You came into this wedding unsure there was going to be a wedding. Yes. So let's yes. remind folks what happened that day. What, we okay. did. We did. We were, we were told that there would be a hearing, that the judge had agreed to a hearing at 8.30 on Thursday morning, and we would find out whether or not the judge would order the clerk to issue the marriage license. So we were told to be at the Travis County Clerk's house, her uh, office, to wait and see what the decision would be. And we got there, and we waited, and there was a positive decision. And but you um, waited about an hour too. Yes, <laughs> yes. we waited a more than an hour. We yes. waited and waited and waited, and uh, with longer, our daughters. The longer you were waiting, the more fearful you got, or what? I don't know. We had some wonderful <laughs> friends there with us, and it was great. Um, and actually, we have an old friend who works for the county clerk. It was kind of great to see him. We hadn't seen him for a while. And um, so, he, you he know, was, you're right. I mean, there, there was a sort of a period where it's like, hmm, uh, what's the hitch? You know, what's the discussion? The clerk also uh, was very uh, courageous in that the clerk had a decision to make. She had been ordered by a judge, but, um, you know, there was a decision as to whether she was going to follow the orders of the judge. And so, um, you know, we thank Dana de Beauvoir for being as courageous as she was in going forward, um, knowing that she personally, you know, might hit, have some fallout from this. Um, and so... That was probably the first example sorry, of the we go. outpouring of love. I'm just going to grab my water, you guys. <laughs> I lost it. Okay. That was probably the first time that... I felt what I've felt many times since when the word came down that the judge's order was positive and that the marriage license would be issued. P 
people in the court and the clerk's office knew what was going on and all of a sudden we were surrounded by people who were cheering and it was it was amazing that to have people who were strangers and to have our friend who we've known for 20 years happened to be a clerk at that office and able to issue the license that was very very special we had been through 20 years of knowing him as a friend haven't seen him very often once a year maybe also went through his partner's death with him so that was very special to, to wrap everything up in such a, a heartfelt way. Hmm. We have a question here uh, from Patsy. What kind of difference do you think being married makes for your kids? And would it have been a bigger difference when they were younger? Uh, boy, that's a, I think that's a really great question. Um, you know, when they're older, I'm going to just sort of speak generally, but you, you give you a little time to think because you're this is kind of something you warm to and know a lot about seeing kids. Suzanne sees a lot of kids, so um, in her adoption work, um, you know, little kids I think may not understand mm -hmm. it as well, but um, I think still they pick up sometimes um, from their really young classmates, or they have difficulty explaining their family, or maybe a little embarrassed about their family, but it's a Older kids kind of really understand the significance. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, do you have well, a sense well, of that? When this all happened, the whirlwind of activity, Thursday morning we said to the girls, we want you to come with us to the clerk's office. We're not sure what's happening. And our younger daughter said, Mom, I can't miss history. History is really hard to make up. And we said, if this happens, you will be making history. And, and remind your daughter Ting is 13. 13. Ting is she's 13. 13 years old. She's an eighth grader. And, and Dawn? So Dawn is uh, 18. 18. Mm -hmm. So we have 18 and 13 year old daughters adopted from China. They were with us that day waiting to see what would happen with the rabbi when he blessed us uh, and married us. And they are so proud. And, and to me, the thing that was the moment I really cried was when at the spontaneous party Thursday night, they, they said, we need your computer, we have a surprise. And they put together a slideshow dedicated to the two best mothers in the world. And they had not only pictures from the computer that we had of our lives with them, but they had gone back and found old photos and scanned them. So there was a picture of our fifth anniversary. There were pictures of us when we were young. And, and uh, Dawn said to Sarah, she said, wow, you were really a looker. Okay. You know, so I think, I think this is really meaning a lot to them because they're old enough to appreciate what it means. What do you think if they'd been five or six? I mean, I think that was part of Patsy's question. Can you I think speculate? they would have loved it. I think it would have been different in their, they wouldn't have understood the legalities of it. They wouldn't have understood the prejudice. They would have just said, oh, fun, can we have a party? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question, and I really don't know the answer. I think it'll mean question. a lot to, to children to know that their families are like everybody else's and that their parents can get married. So that if they go to another wedding with a mom and dad, you know, or a, a man and woman, they can go, oh yeah, and my mom's had a wedding too. It'll just, it'll just help normalize everything in their life. You know, so I, so I think the answer might be the age of the children, it might, it might make this, have the same significance, but just the children understand it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And like the two of you, they faced a room full of reporters like me a couple hours afterward and handled themselves very well. They handled themselves very well. Dawn had been, um, we had gone, um, uh, I think the last time the legislative session, there is, um, uh, Representative Anchia has a birth certificate bill, which is, you know, Bureau of Vital Statistics, we need good data. As an economist, I believe we need good data. Um, and what is, if, if there are two moms um, who are parenting children, there's not an opportunity for the birth certificate to show that, to be accurate. So we have, we have a lot of inaccurate birth certificates in Texas. And our daughter Dawn, I think the first time she really literally had to step up was to step up and speak to, um, there was a hearing on the bill. And I think ever since then she's been, um, she was passionate about it and she cried, she didn't mean to. But she cried anyway, and so I think ever since then she has really felt more comfortable 
in, you know, standing up for her family. I was incredibly proud of our daughters at that moment that you're talking about. Press conference, everything blowing up really fast, the cameras everywhere in a conference room, and our daughters standing up and speaking with great poise about our family. And there's nothing better than a parent hearing how much their daughters love them and, and that they think we're okay parents. Not everybody gets to hear that from a teen. Yeah. yeah. We're going to come back to your daughters, but we have another question here from Eric. Uh, what advice do you have for younger gay people, especially those growing up in environments like many places in Texas that are hostile toward them wow. and or their sexuality? Mm. You know, it's hard, and it's hard. Sarah, Sarah called. We, she has a cousin, Peter, who is, what, 80, in his 80s now. Peter and Billy were together their entire lives. They're both very renowned. And she called Peter up and said, we did this for you and Billy. And I can't imagine what their lives were like when they were growing up. And I just know that it's getting better and that it will get better and better and better for these young people. But another one of the really touching moments was at the party when we took our marriage certificate and all these people wanted to have their pictures made with us. And the, the young people would come up in their 20s and 30s, two boys, two girls, and say, can we have our picture made with you? Someday we want to get married too. And just the hope in their eyes. I know it's hard for young people now, but it is so much better, and it's changing so quickly. And I just, I just hope people will be brave and be out as much as possible when they can, because when you put a face on those young people, when, when people know someone in their family or a friend or in their congregation, it's hard to hate someone that you know because we're just like everybody else. Yeah, I think that's really a good question because as the audience, I hope, knows that um, suicide rates among gay youth are higher than typical. A lot of the homeless population, um, kids getting kicked out of their house. Um, the, I, what's the organization we worked with? LifeWorks. LifeWorks here in Austin. I think the, the data shows that a lot of these kids are LGBT kids um, who, whose home life was not safe for them and they end up on the streets. So these are real, real issues. Um, you know, I, I would say try to seek out whatever kind of support you can in your community. I know there are people who, um, you know, consider themselves good Christians, and once they get to know somebody, um, they, they, I, I had a gentleman from East Texas a long time ago, but basically, um, I was involved in the energy industry, and he ran a small electric co-op. He said, I was, you know, very disappointed. Um, he wasn't looking forward to having to deal with me. And then after we'd interacted some, he really came to me and said, as a Christian man, I want to apologize for basically how I've thought of you and, you know, what I've said about you. And um, he actually, you know, we became good friends and he became essentially an advocate. So I think there are a lot of people out there who's view of their own faith tradition is love is love and um, that I hope these kids can find support from these people. Um, I don't I think that's, you know, and then, you know, the Austin Police Department, there's a great video, it's a couple years old now, but it's uh, Life Gets Better, is that, mm -hmm. you remember it? And it's mm -hmm. just, it's like the Austin Police Department <laughs> and um, the LGBT folks in the police department made a great YouTube video. It's just so inspiring. Mm -hmm. And so I hope there's resources like that and friendships where these kids can confide in people they trust to support them. And we have a, a comment from PJ. Thank you for your bravery. I could not be more proud of two fine people I've never met. Bless you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, PJ. PJ. And you guys are the kind of the star of the show, but that day, the celebration, your marriage certificate was equally a star. Mm -hmm. Oh, more of a star. <laughs> of a star. I tell you, people are like, we've been carrying this certificate around. I think we've even, made, mm -hmm. do you have it? it? We bring it around, you know, with us because people want to see it. People want to take a picture with it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The marriage certificate is the star. 
that day was a whirlwind day. I mean, I try to describe it for readers in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. It didn't end with you saying, I do, and walking back and registering your marriage as fast as you can. I believe, Suzanne, you said before they make it illegal. Um, <laughs> try to make it illegal. Try to make yeah. it illegal. What, um, what, what happened that day? What, what all went, went on? That day unfolded like I couldn't have imagined. Um, the people who were helping us helped us put together information for the press because we were starting to get phone calls from people immediately. Somehow the word got out. And so uh, friends opened up their conference room for us and set a press conference. I can't remember if it was 11, 1 o'clock. Mm. And suddenly at noon, there was a room full of press and cameras and reporters. And it all unfolded and then it kept unfolding all afternoon. Local television stations wanted us to come to the studio. A uh, reporter from Los Angeles wanted us to call. So we're driving to the studio while we're talking to the LA Times reporter on the speakerphone. Mm -hmm. And then our daughters wanted the computer to go and do a surprise. And then by six o'clock there was a party and it was overwhelming. And I had had 10 minutes to take all of the texts from the closest friends who had said congratulations and I cut and pasted 6 p.m. at this place, 6 p.m. at this place. So people, when I was watching the video, I was with my best friend since, I've known her since I was six years old, and I'm 63, and I was standing next to her crying watching this video. It, it, was, it was a whirlwind, amazing magic day. Stop that. <laughs> I can't. I can't. <laughs> I'll just say ditto, you know, it's a, um, there's, a, there's a real, element of kind of surrealism like wow is this really happening and so I, I think I'm that's mostly what I remember is that I don't remember if that makes any sense for anybody to anybody no. I wish I remembered the day better yeah anyone who fast. got married would say about the same thing yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah you know, thank goodness there's photos so you can go back and say oh yeah yeah that's what that happened. did really happen yeah. yes but there were um, at the party it was thrown by the Travis County Democratic Party yes and there was Lloyd Doggett was there, uh, Mayor um, of Boston was there, uh, about 150 other people were there at least early on mm -hmm. when we had a reporter there. Uh, how late did it go? Well, you know, we were tired. So I think we closed it up about... 8 o'clock maybe? 10, no, 10.30, because someone called you and said I was trying to get there but you guys had already left. I don't know. Again, Rachel. it was so fast, I don't know. It happened spontaneously. We stayed until most of the people had gone home. and and. It was just magic how people showed up spontaneously. And I think that's where the social media and the ability for people to communicate with each other really was magic. We used to be on a bike team and friends we had, our bike train teams dissolved. Friends from the bike team showed up. Um, all sorts of, all sorts of people Amazing showed up. Amazing, parents. Yeah, it was just, it was just an amazing yeah, group of people. you know, people. parents, friend, our kids, friends, parents showed up. Both our daughters our brought door, their boyfriends. Uh -huh. Our next door neighbor and her daughter showed up. It was just, you know, it was great. But I, I, th I think 1030 is what I think. Okay. We have something here from Patsy asking, uh, were you good with media before all this or have you had to learn? I had to learn. Yeah, I think you always have to learn. Um, I think, it's, you know, Suzanne's in it, we're both, as you guys might be able to tell, pretty verbal people, right? So, uh, you know, I think we've had to learn. But I think, you know, what I've kind of learned as being older is that if you really kind of get centered in your heart mm -hmm. and you speak from your heart, um, it makes it a whole lot easier. When Sarah and I met, I think before we even realized we were falling in love, we had a, a chance to be at a dinner conversation. And we touched souls and talked about how blessed we were in the world and how we wanted our lives to make a difference. And after that, we started saying, and you know, I think I might be falling in love with you. But our first real connection was that. And so, you know, this is an opportunity and you step up to the plate and you take it. And as Sarah says, you just do your best. And how's the reception been with uh, reporters like me? Great. 
I think it's I think it's been you know very positive. Uh, you know, I did, every news channel, of course, wants to kind of put their own slant on it. Some of the affiliates out in other parts of Texas have kind of put a different slant on, slant on it from what my a local affiliate might. But that's okay. That's great. I mean, that's that's reporting. You know, that's 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 okay. And you know, I I know there are people who disagree with us and may disagree with us strongly and you know this is this is a controversial issue. I'm originally from Lubbock. My parents met in Leveland during the uh, the depression and my dad was the first county attorney in Leveland when they built the courthouse. During the depression my mom had to leave SMU and go to work and she was the music teacher in Leveland and she got to stay in the preacher's house which was the only house with a bathroom and running water. And I used to say my dad was the law and my mom was the culture. And so I'm from West Texas and that's my roots. And so I did look at the Lubbock paper. I haven't looked at all the other small towns. Right. And, but nobody called me from Lubbock. Nobody wanted to report. Mostly they talked about judicial activism. And I, we haven't had any reporters coming in with anything negative. It's it's been it's been so positive. It's pretty amazing. Okay. One thing that uh, struck me about your daughters when they talked to all of us reporters at this press conference was something Dawn said. She said, "Doesn't make any difference. It did, nothing's changed. My parents just, you know, got the impression she considered you all married anyway." Am I stretching there, or is that? I I, I think that it's hard for a kid to admit. You know, we all kind of defend ourselves up. So, and they've told me stuff about occasionally something at school or that, you know, somebody says, hey, what's it like to be adopted? And Dawn kind of has to say, well, hey, that's the tip of the iceberg. You know, I'm from a, you know, not a typical family. So I think there is there, but they're tough, you know, and so, hey, it's not any different, that kind of thing. So I, I think in a way they're wrong, but in a way they're right. You know, we, we, um, for, on school nights, Monday through Thursday, we sit down and have family dinners. That's really important to us. Who cooks? Uh, I thank she you. She plans. You we help both out. Cook. We both cook. Okay. okay, that's it. All right, we both cook. Um, and um, so, in that sense, kind of the real fiber of our family is is pretty tight and isn't going to be uh, changed. But mm -hmm. I already, even as an adult, kind of feel feel. Um, there's something about being able to call Suzanne my wife to other people. I mean, I, I just know for myself, it's made, a, it's made a bigger difference already than I could imagine it would have. What I thought about after this all happened, and, and I turned around and said, my wife, and I thought about if, if I'm meeting somebody, maybe I have a, a guy who's my friend, and he introduces me to his girlfriend. And I'm like, hello, how are you? Nice to meet you. But if he says, I'd like you to meet my wife, then suddenly I want to know that person I'm being introduced to because they have a great connection with the guy that I know. And so it, it, that little example popped up in my head after this all started. And I thought, you know, when somebody says my wife or my husband, it carries a message. And that's what I'm realizing for me now is we've been together so many years, I don't think my commitment and love for her is going to change, but I do think that this is just another layer that is not just for us and our family. We're going to we're gonna still sit down and have family dinners and do homework and everything we do, mm -hmm. but when I can go to someone and say, have you met my wife? They're going to understand yes. what our commitment means. The permanence of that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We have one here from Bert. Have you had any negative comments or attitudes towards you from other LGBTQ people? It's not fair you were the only ones to be able to marry. It isn't fair. You're exactly, it isn't fair. Um, and that's the bittersweet part of this. Um, I don't, I, I'm sure there's a lot of folks out there who are just disappointed that this hasn't broken open for them as well. Um, and I hope it does. Soon. And I, I think that we've had more People, and again, this may be people who can look you in the eye versus people who can't look you in the eye with social media. 
But we've had a lot of people come up and say, thank you for cracking the door open. Mm -hmm. Thank you for putting a face on our families. And if we, if we could swing that door wide for everybody right now, we would. Um, I'm very hopeful the Supreme Court will do that this June. Or the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. One of the things that I'll probably be running about this week is if the Fifth Circuit backs up what Judge Garcia said and rules the Texas ban unconstitutional, it would then go to the U.S. Supreme Court, which has not upheld stays. Mm -hmm. All that means, take the legal out of it, is marriages would be able to start happening in Texas if the Fifth Circuit rules that the ban is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. It could happen tomorrow, today. The Fifth Circuit, we were waiting for that ruling. Anytime. You're right, it absolutely could. And that would be even sooner than June, which would be great. We have one here from Eric. Have you have sorry? Have there been any particular role models in your lives that have helped you both on your path toward this moment? Oh mm -hmm. boy, mm -hmm. I can I you go first. Well, Betty Naylor here in Austin. You know we have a street in Austin named after Betty, uh, and I was lucky enough, have been lucky enough to know Betty Naylor, uh, to have known Betty Naylor. Um, you know it's. It, our local community here in Austin has a lot of heroes in just all sorts of places. Um, you know, we have advocates for the homeless. We have people who just stand up for what they believe in here in Austin. And, you know, I can't roll off a bunch of names for you, um, but those folks. Um, my cousin Peter uh, in California, he and his partner, it wasn't something anybody talked about, but you know, they're heroes for me. Um, wow, it's a good, good question. I'm, have you I thought of some? I want to throw in one more idea of, of a Betty Naylor as a hero is, I remember sitting on the floor in our living room talking to Betty about whether or not we would have kids and we would adopt kids and how would we do that. And I was already getting so much older than most parents. And Betty said, do it. It will be the most wonderful thing you ever do in your life. And here we are. And remind folks, tell us who Betty Naylor is. Betty Naylor was a very brave woman who was an out lesbian. She was a lobbyist at the legislature. Um, who was the fellow she, she was, walked with every morning? Oh, she worked with, um, I think, Pete Laney. They were in a lobby team together. And, and she walked every morning. She took a walk, and, and she was very religious, but very private about it and there was a fellow I can't remember his name now who was a very conservative legislator and she and he every morning took their morning constitutional together and Betty Betty put a face to being a lesbian long before anybody else in Texas that I know of had the courage to do it and she did it by just being herself up at the legislature, doing her job, doing it well. And um, she was an inspiration to all of us who knew her. And, and she was actually, I think, you know, like many people, she was outed, I think, by the San Antonio Express News. She, she had been married to a fellow who was in the Air Force. And I don't really know, but sort of went, and so after that happened to Betty, she decided, you know what, I'm proud of who I am, and she went forward. The other person I would name, I was, um, you know, um, Loving versus Virginia, mm -hmm. the case now more than, well, 40, I don't know how many years 1967. ago. 1967. Thank you. Um, you know, that couple um, moved from Washington, D.C., an interracial couple. And, um, you know, they're heroes. They're heroes of mine as well. We have something here from Angela Marie. says, uh, while marriage is so important and a big step forward, many allies are completely unaware that sexual orientation is not a protected class when it comes to employment. How can we grow awareness of that fact? You know, one of the things that, that worries me is that people in Texas will not realize that. A lot of the states where there is now marriage equality that have had it for a while, places like Massachusetts or California, didn't start out with marriage. They started out with things like protection in your job. You know, protection to go to the hospital, certain things that they, they would give protection to people for so that the building toward marriage took a decade or more. And in Texas, 
we don't have those protections and I'm really afraid somebody's going to go off to California or be able to get married here, put the picture proudly on their desk and get fired the next day because people ought to, to be safe in their homes, people ought to be safe in their jobs and I, I just hope and people ought to realize that they aren't naturally parents. If they're raising a child they still need to do an adoption so they're both legal parents and there's a lot of catching up Texas is going to have to do. I, I, I have the same fear that um, I, I have the same fear, and I think that's 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 a very good um, point to make. All right, let's see. We have uh, we have no more questions in the queue. I think we can wrap it up here with uh, any, any more thoughts. Anything we haven't asked? L let me ask you this one. Um, Producer tells us we're not getting a lot of uh, negative comments, but surely you've had some. What 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 has happened that way with you? Yeah, I th I don't think people have really. It's not directed at us personally, mm -hmm. which I appreciate. And I also think that um, Nicole uh, Nicole uh, Demetman and uh, Cleopatra De Leon, who are the Austin-based plaintiffs in the case now before the Fifth Circuit. I think they um, also told us that they really haven't had, have not been attacked personally, which I think, you know, shows the civility of the other side, so to speak. Um, no, I, I just saw something, you know, I look at, I have looked at some of these negative comments, and I think that some of these people, um, you know, maybe they had some kind of childhood trauma or there's something that they're really, really, really afraid of. And it's very deep, obviously, within these folks. And um, so, I, you know, I'm sympathetic to the fact that these folks are in, somehow our marriage is very threatening to them and brings up a lot of personal pain for them. And, um, you know, I don't know what that's about, but that, that is surprising to me and it's sad. Sarah and I have been out of the closet for a long time. And I can remember in Washington, D.C. being, well, do we, do we let our, our address be published? Do we have a phone number anybody can know? And this was a long time ago, and, and the world was a scarier place, mm. and nothing bad ever happened. And um, I think my belief is that people are basically good. And that, as Sarah says, there are some people who either are afraid or are unable to balance their true caring for other human beings with what their religion tells them. And, and I think that there's going to have to be an evolution where, where the society just holds them and helps them. And one of the things that hits me is um, our daughter, could, our 13-year-old or our 18-year-old couldn't imagine the idea that if they had an African-American friend, they couldn't bring them along to the swimming pool. That is inconceivable to them. Mm. And I, I like to think that in a few years, another generation will look back and say, you mean Suzanne and Sarah couldn't get married? That's inconceivable, why not? You know, I think the world will evolve and we will look back on this time the way we look back on segregation. You know, our culture has changed, and we'll, no matter what a law says, we'll never go back to being a segregated society. And I think this is a cultural shift, much more than a legal shift. They go hand in hand. But I think as the culture changes, it will be a non-issue. We do have a late-breaking question here from Vicki. So what made you decide to wait until you could marry in Texas? For those of us who felt we could not wait once federal benefits became available, Will there be a way for us to get a Texas license eventually? That's the question, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, after so many years, we know we're committed. We know we love each other. It, it's not, I think a lot of people go, oh, well, you can get federal benefits. For us, that's not what it's about. And I don't think when most people go to marry, they stop to look at the federal benefits what is community property? What is separate property? Should we have a prenuptial agreement? I think people fall in love and they get married because they love each other and want to make that commitment. And we've been together a long time and we know we love each other and we know we're committed. So waiting a little longer to do it in Texas was fine with us, but after Sarah's diagnosis, it did become more important to do it sooner. Mm -hmm. 
And we do have a couple more questions. I think once I warn folks that we're heading out, uh, <laughs> right. they, they came along and need to tell you, yeah. I'm a print reporter. I, I'm behind the scenes. This is pretty horrible for me to have to do this in front of everyone, so just bear with me. We have this one from Bert. Eight years ago versus today, do you think having to wait gave you a chance to grow and better prepare for this awesome event? Uh, congrats, by the way. Thank you. I think the answer is yes. You know, one of the things that goes with, uh, I, don't, I don't run as fast, I don't bicycle as far, I, I'm now dealing with this illness, but there are some real benefits of age. There, um, there are. There really are, oh, good. guys, there really are, there really are. I'm, I'm almost 59, and um, I think one of them is um, you develop more compassion and understanding for people who, for differences, and that everybody's in their own struggle to become a better person. Um, and so I think I have, I have more ability for the, for the negativity not to actually, to not to internalize that too much. I think that's the advantage, and I think that probably helps us, you know, um, when we speak about our relationship. And to recap the significance of that question, eight years ago you tried to get a marriage license yes. and were denied. Yes. Anything to add to that? No. Um, eight years ago, we, we understood that there were a few couples going to the county clerk's office to ask for a marriage license and then have a small press conference. And we were asked, will you come? And so we went and we carried a sign with a big heart that said 22 years and two kids and put up pictures of our girls. And we've had that upstairs in our office. And it's, it's been a very sweet reminder as the world has changed in those eight years and I think that's when I really started saying it really would be nice to get married. Wow, that would that would be really special. And so the evolution for me has been that that made me realize perhaps we could. Okay. We have a question from Jim. Tell us more about the adoption of your daughters. Was it difficult to decide or there challenges in that process? You know, it's interesting because she was talking about this, and um, we were living in we were living in Washington D.C. And Suzanne had been working. I think we we're already in D.C. She had a public interest job in uh, California, and she came back. And I just thought, like you know, many lesbian couples our age, that we probably weren't ever going to be able to raise children. And I think you came back from California, where mm -hmm. kind of things were breaking on on the frontier, and said, you know we can have kids. And I was kind of like, ugh, you know. Um, and so I had to, it took me a while to get used to that idea. So, I'd always uh, thought I'd have children. I love kids. And so one of the biggest heartbreaks for me was that I was falling in love with her and might not raise children. And so in 1986, that whole issue was evolving. And suddenly I was realizing, yes, we can have children and so then um, probably a decade later we decided to adopt our children and it was pre-internet and it was trying to figure out how could we do it and calling up agencies and keeping charts of things and a friend said come meet my Chinese daughter and I said oh Sarah's out of town I'm busy and he said no come over tonight and I met his daughter Michelle who is now off to college okay. and I started crying and crying and crying and I said Sarah come with me to uh, this adoption agency meeting where they'll show a video and she sat and watched the video and cried and cried and cried and that was the beginning of our path to China and you had 10 years to prepare for that moment um, or more. Or more, okay, to, to get used to the idea. Mm -hmm. right. um, a bit longer than I think most people take. Or did that? <laughs> I yeah. don't think, I think we started, as Sarah says, thinking, well, you can't have children. And we're not the beginning of what's called the gaby boom or the gay baby boom, but there are thousands and thousands of families in Texas raising children together. And so somebody in their 20s now who says, I want to be a parent, and this is the woman or man I love, we may not be able to create a child together, but we certainly can have a loving home for a child. And so there are a lot, young people now don't think twice about whether or not they can have children. But when we started out, we thought twice. 
And Nicole and Cleo, the Austin couple who sued to overturn the Texas ban, have a child due in March. In fact, that's one of the reasons that they asked the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals to lift the stay. Um, it's, the argument is it's becoming more of a hardship for them, and the Fifth Circuit has not yet ruled on that, which is perhaps another avenue where uh, same-sex marriage could come to Texas. Mm -hmm. the, the court probably is unlikely to rule on that, given that they're going to rule sometime soon on the underlying issue. Is it unconstitutional for same-sex couples to get married in Texas? All right, I think we're coming to the end here. I appreciate the chance. Any final thoughts from the two of you about the experience, the whirlwind, what's coming in the future, uh, your uh, relationship? If, I, if you ask me what I was, have been struck by the most, it would be the outpouring of love and support that we've received. Just a never, never, ever could have predicted it. And from around the nation. You guys made headlines from coast to coast. Well, we had friends staying with us from Guatemala, actually. A friend, well, my, our friend's from North Texas. He's Guatemalan, and he brought a friend who lives in Guatemala. And he said, well, you made the Guatemala papers. I never would have thought of that. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah well. We had no idea. We had no idea how big this would get, but we're privileged to be in this position, and it could be any of us. It could be any one of those thousands of Texas families, and I just hope that rather than feeling like why you and not me that they can understand we didn't really ask for this it came to us and we accepted it and it, and it will be you soon and it will be you soon All right. good note to end on thank you very much for your time and thank you for watching thank you